Hello to you. I'm Michelle Eve, and welcome to episode 8 of the Mystical Times blog podcast. In this episode, I'll be sharing three ghostly experiences with you. These experiences involve a haunted rectory, a haunted pub, and a horrifying time for a couple who were house-sitting for their friends. All of these experiences took place in Gloucestershire. But just what causes a haunting in a building? Do those who have died come back to a place where they have unfinished business? And why is it that only some people seem to get affected by ghostly behaviours and others don't see or hear anything? It was in 1947 when the Chills family, Mr Chills, his wife and their two small daughters, moved to the rectory in Wick Rissington in Gloucestershire. Mr. Chills had served as an army chaplain during World War II, so now was a good time to find a parish where all the family could live together again. The previous rector to the Cotswold village of Wick Rissington had only lasted nine months, and when Mr. Chills inquired why such a short time, he was told that the children of the family had suffered from terrible nightmares there. Mr. Chills found the response rather odd, but pushed it to the back of his mind. The rectory was built in various eras, and the previous rector had closed off the Elizabethan and Queen Anne parts of the building and had only lived in the Victorian part. Mr. Chills decided it would be better to live in the Elizabethan part and not the Victorian part. All was quiet for the first month. It was when Mr. and Mrs. Chills were in bed one night that they heard footsteps coming up the stairs. They described the footsteps as like those who were wearing hobnail boots and would take slow and measured steps whilst climbing the stairs. These footsteps were heard five times during the next week and would always follow the same pattern. Slow and steady footsteps up the stairs. Then the footsteps would walk on the landing, right by the chill's bedroom. Then it would walk past the room again, and back down the stairs. When Mr. Chills would open the bedroom door to investigate, there was no one there, but the footsteps would still be heard. Mr. Chills started asking around the village about these strange footsteps and found two elderly ladies who had once worked as maids at the rectory. They went on to describe that they had shared a room whilst working and living at the rectory, and that one night both were woken up and had both seen an elderly man with a full white beard peering at them, who then just disappeared. They asked for a new room after this happened, and it seemed that whoever slept in that room would be visited by the bearded spectre, and no one wanted to sleep in it. And in 1900, the room was turned into a bathroom. When the Chills had been in the rectory for around three months, is when things took a turn for the worse. During the night, an ear-piercing, disembodied scream was heard. This made the children cry out in terror from their sleep, and Mr and Mrs Chills was scared witless by it, but it was to build up to a very violent happening. It was one night when Mr and Mrs Chills were lying down in bed, what felt like an explosion erupted under their bed, and they were physically lifted out, their windows were rattling, and plaster from the ceiling fell onto them. This frightening incident was enough for Mr Chill to visit the rural dean to ask for a new parish or new place to live, as all the chills had had enough of this haunting. The rural dean listened to Mr. Chill and all that his family had gone through, and he was a man with many years' experience, so related the experiences of Epworth Rectory, home of the Reverend Sam Wesley, father of John Wesley, the founder of Methodism in 1716, and he found out the more he prayed, the worse the haunting became, and he came to the belief that what was ever was haunting his residence was reacting to all the prayers. So it was decided to take no notice of the haunting and not to pray about it, and it worked. 
So Mr. Cheel took the same attitude. He told his children that the ghost was called Geoffrey, that he looked like Father Christmas, and had once lived in their house, so would come at night to revisit it. The Cheel family undertook this attitude, and as time went on, the visitations became fewer, until the only things to happen were the ghost of a black cat, who would be seen from time to time around the house, and on the same day every year, the sound of a window smashing would be heard. It would appear that the Cheels lived in that rectory for many years afterwards, and were said to be happy there. Now we go from Wick Rissington to the medieval town of Tewkesbury, and we're going to visit the Black Bear Inn. Horses clattering down the street and into the lounge of a building, which was once known as the Black Bear of Warwick. A man dressed in an ancient riding habit with a flowing coat appears in an upstairs bedroom of the old house. These are the sounds and sights which have interested and puzzled the Beck family who owned the Black Bear Inn in Tewkesbury in the 1930s. The wide, low-roofed lounge provides a clue to the mysterious clatter horse hooves which were heard at night. In that room, in those far-off days, when visitors came by horse, the horses were put into the stables. Now just the beams alone remain of the original stable. Perhaps these horses' hooves, which have awakened the family on many nights, are those of the mounts of travellers. Perhaps they are animals returning to the stalls where they found comfort from the cruel winter journeys of olden days. Maybe they are ridden by knights, seeking refuge after the Battle of Tewkesbury, the days of Red Rose and White Rose, for it is known for a fact that many men came to the inn for attention to their wounds. Whatever the reason, the Becks are convinced that they hear these hooves passing when no one can be seen in the street outside. The building of the inn stood by King John's Bridge, and in the late years of the 12th and from the early part of the 14th century, men had congregated there for fellowship and good cheer. It has every right to an atmosphere, said John Beck, the son of the landlord. He said that he had seen the apparition in the upper room. I've seen him three times, at night and in the twilight of a summer sunset. I saw him about three weeks before Christmas and had previously determined to speak to him on the next occasion. I tried to ask him what he was doing, but the words wouldn't come out. Every time I meet him, I am dumbfounded, yet always look forward to his appearance. He went on to explain that the person he saw was a young man with fair hair and a long rifling cloak. He never saw him appear, but had a strange feeling that somebody was behind him. Turning, he saw the young man, who then disappeared. Each time he was standing in the doorway, and I never felt in the least frightened or even worried. I want to see him again. The curious thing about it, John said, was that the ghost is not at all what you would expect. He is not transparent. There is no ghostly shining white about him. It is just as though the man was standing in daylight, even though I see him at night, and he doesn't do anything. When I step forward, instinctively, he disappears, and no one else to his knowledge had seen the apparition, but many people had felt the strange sensation as though someone was watching them. and it's from Tewkesbury we go, to the Cotswold village of Winchcombe. It was in the mid-1980s when Derek and Miranda were asked to dog and house-sit for their friends. Their friends lived in a rather lovely historic house, Georgian and Jacobean in style, but built over a previous building so that the cellars were Elizabethan. The large back garden still housed a grotto, where a hermit was said to have lived in the 12th century. Derek and Miranda were living in a small cottage, so jumped at the chance to live somewhere more palatial. Both were dog lovers, but lacked space for their own pet dog, so it was a chance to live differently for a couple of months, 
and it wasn't long until they moved in and took responsibility for the house and two dogs. It was during the summer, so they spent many days and evenings with the dogs outside in the garden. It was Derek who first noticed a change in the atmosphere inside the house. He felt watched, and whatever was watching him felt resentful. Despite it being hot outside, the house, in certain areas, felt cold, colder than what was expected. Both Derek and Miranda felt as though they were being silly and feeling this way, and tried to pay it no attention. But it was when they started to ignore it, strange things started to occur. If they had been out for the evening, they would come back and find the interior lights had been switched on. Both had been away at work during the day, and they hadn't switched any lights on as there had been no need. This happened several times. Each time they would go round and switch the lights off. Whatever was causing this to happen wasn't best pleased in the nonchalant way in which the couple dealt with the lights. It was then that when they returned home after work, the radio would be blaring out. Again, they were certain that no radio would have been left on, as either one would have heard it before leaving the house. One particular weekend morning, Miranda decided to stay in bed whilst Derek attended to the dogs. She was thinking of what plans they had for the weekend, when suddenly the handle of the closed bedroom door started to rattle, as though someone was trying to open the door. Miranda screamed out loud, and Derek came running up. He opened the door with ease, and Miranda told him why she had screamed. They tried to think of a reasonable explanation as to why the handle had rattled, and decided it may have been a large vehicle going past, and the vibration had caused it to rattle. It was later that week that both were sitting on the sofa watching TV with the dogs, when the door of the living room flung itself open. It was flung so hard that it banged against the wall and an ornament fell off a wooden shelf. The dogs reacted to the event by barking aggressively towards the door. They managed to calm the dogs down and again tried to rationalise what had happened. Miranda said she couldn't and no longer wanted to talk about it. Let's just ignore it, she said. It hasn't hurt us, just shocked us and the dogs a bit. Whatever was causing these things to happen seemed to take what Miranda said as a challenge. It started just a few days later. They were in the kitchen, washing and drying the evening saucepans and plates. Both felt something brush up against them as it went past. It also swung the hanging saucepans too. They later saw a large bag of embroidery threads being shaken and moved by invisible hands. They couldn't ignore the oppressive feeling of the house anymore and were counting the days till their friends would come back so they could go back to their small but quiet cottage. They had had three more nights left, so that night they decided to go to bed earlier than normal, as the house felt particularly unpleasant. They both fell asleep, but kept waking up, and it was around 3am in the morning when Derek noticed the sounds of the dogs barking, and what sounded like water, he realised that the sink in the ensuite had both taps turned on fully, so he got out of bed, turned off the taps and went downstairs to calm the dogs down. Once he calmed them down, he went back to bed. As soon as he switched off his bedside light, the sound of water gushing from the taps was heard again. So again, he got out of bed and then switched the taps off. This was also to happen on the last two nights as well. When their friends come back to the house, Derek and Miranda told them of what had been happening. The friends said that when their son had been small, he would often talk of the kind lady, all dressed in black, who would comfort him if he woke up in the early hours of the morning. They also said that many of their visitors had also seen black cloaked figures walking around the house and garden, but they had never seen these figures. According to local legend, there is said to be an old tunnel or passage that leads from the original building to the local monastery. The monks that lived in this monastery had been Benedictines, who were sometimes known as black monks. No more reports have come from this house, whether that's because nothing further has happened, or whoever lives there prefers to ignore this poltergeist behaviour, we don't know. That 
that's all for this episode, and I do hope you enjoyed listening to these ghostly stories from Gloucestershire. And don't forget, if you've had a paranormal experience in Gloucestershire, then I would love to hear it. You can email me at mysticaltimesblog at gmail.com. And for my next episode, I'll be sharing some spooky tales from the county of Somerset here in the UK. Till next time.